Uh, I would like to start our small research fellow workshop. I'm very glad about uh, your participation in the workshop. Uh, many thanks to you all. My name is Kotaro Hiraoka, a part-time lecturer at Doshia University. Uh, today's guest speaker is Professor Zeb, uh, Zeb Harvey. Uh, I'm so grateful for giving us today uh, today's lecture, Professor Harvey. Thank you very much. He's a professor emeritus of uh, Jewish thought uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, he received PhD at Columbia University in 1973 and started teaching at the Hebrew University in 1977. Uh, professor Harvey wrote more than uh, 200 articles. Is, is it correct? Uh, on yes. medieval and modern Jewish philosophy, <laughs> including uh, physics and metaphysics in Hasidic Eskas. Uh, I met him for the first time at the Hebrew University in uh, 2001, when, when I took his course, Maimonides' Guide of Perplex. I remember that I learned also his course called Trat Medina Be Philosophia Yudit Mi Filo Ad Yamenu, Political Teaching, in Jewish philosophy from uh, Philon until our days. Uh, since then, he is always my mentor in Jewish studies. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Jerusalem in Midrash and Jewish philosophy. Uh, please welcome Professor Zeb Harvey. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ori. Uh, good. Good afternoon from uh, Jerusalem, uh, where we are still in the morning. It is nine o'clock here in the morning. Um, I wish to thank Professor Ada Tagar Cohen and uh, Dr. Kotaro Ori Hiraoka and Dr. Anri Ishiguro for inviting me to speak to you uh, this morning. My subject is Jerusalem in Midrash and Jewish philosophy. I will thus be speaking about Jerusalem from Jerusalem. Let us, uh, let us uh, begin. The first topic I want to speak about is God's dwelling place. Where does God dwell? After the miracle at the Red Sea, when the children of Israel left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea, the Israelites sang a song of thanksgiving to God who had liberated them from the house of bondage, from slavery. <laughs> At this great moment, when the Israelites were crossing the Red Sea, what were they thinking about? What were their hopes? What were their dreams? At this great moment, what did they say? What were they thinking about? And the answer is Jerusalem. The liberated slaves, now free from their pursuers, began to dream of Jerusalem. According to this, in the Song of the Sea, Shiratayam, the Song of the Sea, they exclaimed, the book of Exodus chapter 15, this is the, the first source on the source sheet, Exodus 15, 17. Thou bringest them in and plantest them in the mountain of thine inheritance. To be emo vetita emo bahar nachalatcha, the place for thy dwelling which thou hast made, O Lord, mahon l'shivtacha pa'alta Adonai, the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established, mikdash Adonai kanunu yadecha, you have taken us out of Egypt. The Israelites say to God, you took us out of Egypt. And now you shall bring us into the mountain of thine inheritance, Har Nachalatcha, the temple mount in Jerusalem, the place you have made for your dwelling. He uses the word Mechon Leshiv How are we to understand the reference to this place for thy dwelling? Mechon Leshiv What does it mean? What is Mechon Leshiv In the temple, is the temple, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, is it literally a place for God's dwelling? As if the creator needs a stone house? 
Is not the whole world full of God's glory? Why does God need a house? What is this Mahon Lashiv God needs a place for his dwelling. In Exodus 25, 8, it says, They shall make me a sanctuary, and I will dwell amongst them. It doesn't say I will dwell in the sanctuary. It says I will dwell among the people. Right? Not I will dwell in it, but I will dwell amongst them. So why does God need a place for his dwelling? What is this expression? Moreover, what does the word mahon, which is translated here by the place, what does it really mean? Is it not the common, it's not the common word for place, right? Makom is the proper, the normal Hebrew word for place. Mahon appears nowhere else in the Pentateuch, nowhere else in the Torah, although it does appear several times elsewhere in the Bible. Its meaning is unclear. What does Mahon mean? Its root is kaf vav men, nun, which comes from the verb to found or to lay a foundation. In modern Hebrew, Mahon means institute. For example, Mahon Weizmann, the, the, the Weizmann Institute, or HaMahon Lamadei HaYahadut, the Institute for Jewish Studies. The word Mahon looks like it is related to the Arabic word Makan. It's what they, they call in French a faux frère. It looks, Mahon looks exactly like it's etymologically related, related to Makan, which means place. But makan is derived from the root kana, to be, and is not, not connected with laying foundations. And there's really no connection between machon, machon, and makan. There is a par parallel use of the word in the prayer by King Solomon. And this is sources two and three. Look at sources two and three. When Solomon dedicates the temple on the occasion of the dedication of the Beit HaMikdash, Solomon basically quotes our verse from Exodus, Mahon l'shivtacha. He uses the expression Mahon l'shivtacha olamim, and uh, that a place for God's dwelling eternally, a place for God's dwelling forever. He is basically quoting the song at the sea. What Solomon says, and we, say, we have two versions of it, one in the book of Kings and one in the book of Chronicles, one in one Kings and one in two Chronicles. Solomon is basically quoting what the song of the Israelites who uses the expression, Mahon l'shiv tacha. Whenever the plain sense of a, of a uh, biblical word is not clear, the Midrash enters, right? Midrash, homiletic, homiletic interpretation, comes to play when the simple reading is not clear. And we, what is this word machon? What is machon l'shiv tacha? A famous midrash found in several rabbinic sources. We'll look at the one from the Mechilta, which is source number four, takes its cue from the enigmatic word machon and goes on to confront the theological question raised by the notion of God's supposedly needing an earthly dwelling place. Let's look at text number four. The Midrash changes the vocalization, vocalization of Machon and reads Michuvan. Right? You can change Machon to Michuvan simply by changing the vowels. You don't have to change letters, you just change the vowels. And Machon gets turned into Michuvan, which means to be aligned, to be lined up with something. So the Midrash changes the vocalization of Mahon and reads, Michuvan l'shivtacha, namely, it is aligned with your dwelling place, and thus deftly transfers God's dwelling place from earth to heaven. Look what the Midrash does by saying, Michuvan l'shivtacha, it takes God's place of dwelling, shivtacha, his place of dwelling, and it's no longer on the earth, but it becomes in the heaven. The temple is not God's dwelling place, but it is aligned with God's dwelling place in heaven. The biblical text now says, your sanctuary is aligned with your dwelling place, i.e. your earthly temple in Jerusalem. The earthly Beit HaMikdash in Jerusalem 
is precisely underneath your heavenly throne. The Hebrew word shivtacha, translated as thy dwelling, comes from the word lashevet, right, to sit, means literally thy sitting, and it is thus naturally identified in the Midrash with God's throne, kisei hakavod. The theocentric description of the temple is turned into an anthropocentric one, right? The Midrash turns the verse from its theocentric sense, namely the temple in Jerusalem is the house of God, and it makes it anthropocentric. The temple in Jerusalem is aligned with the house of God. The temple is no longer a hospice for God, but a place aligned with the throne, that is a place eminently suitable for human beings to have direct communication with God. So instead of saying that the temple is mahon l'shevtachah, the temple is not the place where God dwells, the temple is a place which is connected with God. Right? So we, it becomes anthropocentric and not theocentric. It's a place where people can have direct communication with God. It was not built, the temple was not built to fulfill God's need for a house. It doesn't say I will dwell in it, but it was built to be the center of communication between God and human beings. I will dwell amongst them. So the Midrash, uh, by just changing the vocalization of Mahon and turning it into Michuvan, gives a completely new theological interpretation of the verse. It no longer is saying that the temple is a house for God. It's saying that the temple is a place of communication between human beings and God. The temple is michuvan. It's directed, it's aligned. It's lined up with the heavenly throne. Rabbi Solomon ben Isaac, namely Rashi, the great 11th century commentator, sums everything up in source five. Mahon l'shivtacha, what does Mahon l'shivtacha mean? Mikdash shel mata, right? The temple, the earthly temple, the temple below, Mikdash shel mata, Mikhuvan keneged kisei shel mala, is aligned with the throne of glory above. Kisei is shivtacha, Mahon l'shivtacha, Mikhuvan l'kisei, asher pa'alta. The earthly temple here in Jerusalem is aligned, Michuban, with the divine throne, Shiftacha in heaven. To be in Jerusalem is to be aligned with the throne of glory. And so now as I'm sitting here in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is aligned. It's, under, it's directly underneath God's throne of glory. We now move we now can move on to our second uh, topic on the source sheet, namely the gate, the, uh, the gate of heaven. Uh, the gate of heaven is, we see, uh, the topic of the gate of heaven discusses the dream that Jacob has in Genesis chapter 28. Jacob's dream uh, in Genesis 28 was often interpreted in the light of the Midrashic teaching that the Temple Mount is aligned with the heavenly throne. This idea that we just saw, that the Temple Mount is michuvan, it's aligned with Kisei HaKabod, this idea was used to explain other places, to Midrashically, homiletically explain other places in the Bible. For example, upon awakening from his dream, this great dream that Jacob uh, sees a ladder and angels, angels are olim v'yordim, angels are going up and down the ladder. Uh, when he, this in, in the source sheet number six, Jacob, when he sees these angels going up and down the ladder, he exclaims, and this is the gate of heaven. The shar hashamayim, the gate of heaven, shar hashamayim. The rabbis explain that Jacob, although he was in Luz or Bethel, had somehow miraculously dreamed his dream at the Mount of the Lord in Jerusalem. Right? It's like you're giving a talk sitting here in Jerusalem and somehow you're actually in Kyoto. 
right? I, I don't I don't think anybody could understand this midrash until modern times when 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 you can be in one place and another place at the at the at the uh, at the at the same time. But according to according to this uh, according to the midrash, according to the simple reading of the biblical text, Jacob is not in Jerusalem, but he's in Bet El. He's in Luz or in Bet El. But then all of a sudden in his dream, he's in Jerusalem. Jacob's ladder, uh, uh, so the, the phrase, the gate of the, the rabbis explained that Jacob, although in Luz or Beth El, had somehow miraculously dreamed his dream at the Mount of the Lord in Jerusalem. Because it says, Hamakom, the place. And the place is, of course, Jerusalem. And the phrase gate of heaven therefore refers either to Jerusalem, which is aligned with the throne of glory, or perhaps to the throne itself. Is the gate of Jerusalem, is the gate of heaven Jerusalem, or is Jerusalem aligned with the gate of, of heaven? Jacob's ladder, accordingly, right, Sulam Yaakov, Jacob's ladder, accordingly symbolizes the direct communication between the earthly temple and the heavenly temple. In the words of Rabbi Judah Halevi, in source sheet number, number uh, uh, paragraph number seven, thy maker opened thy gates to face the gates of heaven, right? The hayotzrech patach lemul sha'arech shachak sha'arech. God opens up the gates of heaven to face the gates of Jerusalem. Gates of Jerusalem are opened up towards the gates of heaven. Rabbi Moses ben Nachman, or Nachmanides, known as Haramban, Moshe ben Nachman, the famed 13th century biblical exegete and Kabbalist, made the following comment about Jacob's phrase, the gate of heaven. This is source sheet, paragraph number nine. From here you learn, writes Nachmanides or Ramban, that anyone who prays in Jerusalem is like one who prays before the throne of glory. So to say one's prayers in Jerusalem is like praying directly in front of the throne of glory. Namely, there is something holy about Jerusalem, something holy, sacred about Jerusalem that enables one to connect, have direct connection with God. For uh, uh, for the gate, for the gate, the gate of heaven is open to hear the the prayer of Israel. There there used to be uh, there used to be a joke about the uh, uh, that uh, that one of the prime ministers of Israel, I think, said to the president of the United States that. Uh, uh, He's going to he's he's going to call he's going to call God on the telephone uh, to to find out whether how he should act, and the president said that's probably going to cost a lot of money to cost to call God on the telephone. And he said no, it's a local call. Right. So uh, th this is the idea that the rabbis had about Jerusalem. When you're in Jerusalem, you are connected to the divine. You are connected to God. Uh, so Rabbi Moses ben Nachman or Nachmanides, the Ramban, the famed 13th century biblical exegete and Kabbalist, he writes, from here you learn that anyone who prays in Jerusalem is like one who prays before the throne of glory. For the gate of heaven is open to hear the prayer of Israel. When you pray in Jerusalem, you're praying right underneath the gate of heaven. According to Ramban, Nachmanides, according to his mystical doctrine, his Kabbalistic doctrine, the gate of heaven is the Shrina, the divine presence, the lowest of the ten Svirot. The gate of heaven is the Shrina, that is the tenth and lowest of the divine Svirot, sometimes called Atara or Malchut. It is called the gate of heaven since it is the opening to all the higher Svirot making human prayer to God possible. One enters in Jerusalem, one enters the Shrina, and that is the gate of heaven. Nachmanides' view that the phrase gate of heaven refers to Jerusalem's being a place of prayer 
right? What does it mean to say Sha'ar HaShamayim? It means that Jerusalem is a perfect place for prayer because you're close to God. Is found also among many other commentators, including Rashi in his commentary on Genesis 28, 17. And in accordance with this view, many synagogues throughout the world are called Shar HaShamayim. Like the name Shar HaShamayim is used for many synagogues uh, all, over, all over the world. And it's based on this Midrash, that uh, in this interpretation by Ramban, that Shar HaShamayim means a place that's fit for prayer, a place, that's a, a place that is appropriate for prayer. However, other commentators, such as Isaac Abarbanel, the great statesman and uh, political philosopher in the 15th century, and Moses Mendelssohn, the, the father of modern Jewish philosophy in the 18th century, did not agree with Nachmanides. They said, if you look at the biblical text, it doesn't say that the Shar HaShemayim means that Jerusalem is a good place for prayer. Of course, it is a good place for prayer, but that's not what Shar HaShemayim means. If you look at a Brabanel on the source sheet, paragraph number 10, he explains the expression, the gate of heaven, Muhan Lahoradat Hashefa Milamala. It's a place that is disposed to bring the divine emanation down from above. Down from above, not to the above. Jerusalem is a place of prophecy. Shah HaShemayim refers to prophecy. It doesn't refer to prayer. It's from the above to the below. It's not from the below to the above. The same idea is found in Mendelssohn. Uh, Mendelssohn, the as they say, the great father of Jewish philosophy, who edited, who, ed, who translated the, uh, the Torah into, from, from, in, from Hebrew into German. Uh, and he also edited a Hebrew uh, commentary on the Torah known as the Beyur. Uh, he wrote himself part of the part of the Beyur, and other scholars wrote uh, other parts of the Beyur. Uh, this section of the Beyur that he wrote, uh, that this section of the Beyur was, was written uh, by uh, Solomon Dubno. And you can see that Dubno, in his commentary, let's just look at it, the commentary, he agrees with Nachmanides, none other than the, none other than the house of God, right, Beit Elohim. And a person may pray there, says Dubno, Right, he's, he's writing this commentary, which is being edited by Mendelssohn. And a person may pray here in times of need, for it is a chosen place. So Udub now explains, explains the expression Shar HaShemayim, just like Ramban, namely it's a place of prayer. And this is the gate of heaven, namely a place of prayer where one's prayers rise to heaven. However, the, continues Udub now, however, the German translator, right, Mitargem uh, Ashkenazi, which is Moses Mendelssohn, interpreted, interpreted it in a parenthetical note. If you look, there's a parenthetical note, which you can see down on the, on the bottom of the German translation. Mendelssohn adds a parenthetical note in his, in his, uh, in his translation. And Mendelssohn translates it as, a, in his parenthetical note, a place disposed for the reception of the emanation of prophecy and for seeing of visions from heaven, right? It's a place for Shefa Hanavua, it's a place for receiving, a place disposed for the reception of prophecy and for the seeing of visions from heaven. Kibul Shefa Hanavua, Shar HaShemayim means it's a place that is fit for prophecy. Jacob's dream of the latter is all about prophecy, it's not about prayer. Mendelssohn says, if you look at the uh, if, uh, for, for in what he, Jacob, saw, what Jacob saw in his dream, there is no evidence that the place is disposed for prayer. But what he saw was that the Lord was in that place and that there was a gate of heaven from which God appears to his servants. So Shar HaShemayim is a place where God appears to human beings. It's not a place where human beings, not, doesn't mean that it's a place where human beings praise to God. So we have two interpretations of Shara Shemayim.
two interpretations about what is special about Jerusalem. Is it a place of prayer where one can pray to God and be easily heard? Or is it a place of prophecy where God speaks to human beings? Does Shar Shamayim mean that human beings speak to God? Or does it mean that God speaks to human beings? Who is right? Uh, we, well, fortunately, we have no need to decide today between uh, these commentators. We can say that Jerusalem is a two-way gate, a gate that swings forth in both ways, a two-way gate. It is a city of prayer, and it is also a city of prophecy, a city in which earth speaks to heaven and heaven speaks to earth. We have now come to our third subject, which is the two Jerusalems. There's not just one Jerusalem but there are two uh, Jerusalems. In some Midrashic texts, the idea of the Temple Mount aligned with the throne of glory, was expanded into that of the earthly Jerusalem aligned with the heavenly Jerusalem. Right? It's not just the temple that's aligned with the throne of glory, but it's all of Jerusalem that is aligned with the throne of glory. This theme of two Jerusalems, uh, 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 an earthly Jerusalem and a heavenly Jerusalem, there's an earthly Jerusalem which is aligned to a heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, there's a Jerusalem Shelmala and a Jerusalem Shelmata. There's a low Jerusalem and a high Jerusalem. There's a Jerusalem on earth and a Jerusalem in heaven. This theme of two Jerusalems is developed, for example, in a Midrash on Hosea, chapter 11, which in the source sheet is text number 12. You see, text number 12, the verse from the prophet Hosea, which reads as follows. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. God says, I will not. Uh, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. Uh, uh, God says, I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim, for I am God and not man. I am God and not a human being. The Holy One is in the midst of thee, and I will not come the ear. Now, this is a very strange word, I will not come the ear, which... Uh, is generally understood according to its simple meaning is I will not come in anger, namely as a parallel uh, to the haron api, right? I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not come in anger, right? I will not come in fury, in anger into the city. I will not come, I will, I will not come in, excuse me, I will not come in, in fury. However, Be'ir also looks, the word probably means, I will not come, Be'ir probably means in a simple sense, I will not come in anger, I will not come in fury. But according to the Midrash, if you look at the word Be'ir, it also looks like it means in the city, I will not come into the city. Lo avo Be'ir, I will not come into the city. Uh, so it, the word Be'ir could have two meanings. It will mean I will not come in anger or I will not come into the city. Now, the simple reading is I will not come into the city. The Midrashic meaning is I will not, the simple meaning is I will not come in anger. The Midrashic meaning is I will not come into the city. Uh, the, the untranslated word Be'ir is of uncertain meaning. It is often translated as in fury or in hatred or in, uh, in, in anger. The, the, un, the unclarity of the uh, meaning of the ear, and there's, there's similar readings in, in Samuel 1, Samuel 28, 16, and Isaiah 14, 21. The unclarity of the meaning of the ear, like that of the meaning of Mahon, provides an invitation or an occasion for mid, the Midrashic imagination. One Midrash found in the Talmud, Babylonian Talmud, Ta'anit, page 5a, in the source sheet number 13, takes Be'ir as meaning in the city, right? Be in an ear city, right? Be'ir, in the city. That is the city of Jerusalem. Hosea's passage in this 
is thus made to read, I, the Holy One, I, the Holy One, am in the midst of thee, the Kir Bacha Kadosh, and I will not come into the city, below Avo Be'ir, I will not come into the city. How can God both be in the city, in the midst of thee, and not in the city, I will not come into the city, right? So in this Midrashic meaning, the when you read, instead of saying, I will not come in anger, I will not come into the city, how can you possibly, what, what does it mean? It means, I and God am amongst you, but I will not come into the city. The Midrashic answer is simple. There are two cities, two Jerusalems. The Midrash in Tani puts it as follows. What is written, I, the Holy One, am in the midst of thee, and I will not come into the city? Because I, the Holy One, am in the midst of you, I will not come into the city. Said the Holy One, blessed be he, I will not enter Jerusalem on high, Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Shalmala. I will not come into Yerushalayim, Shalmala, until I have entered the Jerusalem down below, Yerushalayim, Shalmala. So this is what the Midrash is saying. There are two, two Jerusalems. There is a Jerusalem on high, Yerushalayim, Shalmala, and there's our Jerusalem down here, Yerushalayim, Shalmala. God says, I will not come into Yerushalayim Shalmata until I will first, I will not come into Yerushalayim Shalmala, I will not come into my heavenly Jerusalem until I first come into your earthly Jerusalem. I will not enter Jerusalem on high, Yerushalayim Shalmala, until I have entered Yerushalayim Shalmata. And then the Talmud continues, is there indeed a Jerusalem on high? What, there's really this Jerusalem up in the heaven? Is there really a Jerusalem on high? And the Talmud says, yes, for it is written, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, is built like a city which is bound together. Ke'ir shechubra la yachdav. It's built just like a city to which it is connected. Now, uh, this expression, built like a city to which is bound together from Psalms 122, means that it's built like a well-planned city, a city that is well-connected means that a city that is well-planned, that its boroughs uh, fit together, you can get from one place to another place easily. Uh, the walls are all connected, a city that is compact, a city that is well-planned. But here the Midrash understands it. It's like a city, it's like a city that is connected to something. God, according to this Midrash, turns to Israel and says, I cannot enter my heavenly Jerusalem until you let me into your earthly Jerusalem. Right? I can't come into the heavenly Jerusalem, Yerushalayim Shalmala, until you allow me to come into the Yerushalayim Shalmata. The existence of two Jerusalems is Midrashically proved by reference to an apparently superfluous use of the pronoun la, right? Ke'ir shechubra la yachtav. What does that la refer to? What is connected to? What's that? What is the la, that ear, the city that is connected to something? What it's connected to? Ke'ir shechubra la yachtav. The verse in, in its simple meaning says that Jerusalem is built as a city bound together. That is, it's built well, its parts fit together boroughs fit together, its walls are interconnected. However, this would be its meaning even without the pronoun la. So what then does the pronoun la add? One explanation is that it is simply idiomatic, and has no cognitive value. Such an explanation is unacceptable to the Midrashic mentality, which seeks meaning in every nook and cranny. The Midrash thus deduces from the apparently superfluous La that Jerusalem is built like the city to which La it is bound together. Our earthly Jerusalem is connected to a heavenly Jerusalem and it is built similar to it. Our Jerusalem is built similar in a similar way. It reflects the Jerusalem on high. Right. It is in, in Rashi's words in source sheet number 14, text number 14 in the source sheet, the heavenly Jerusalem is the chavera or the dugma 
of the earthly Jerusalem. Namely, it is the paradigm, the paradigma of the heavenly Jerusalem. Right now, once we say that the that that there's this heavenly Jerusalem, uh, we begin to think that are the rabbis talking about a world of ideas? That there is a heavenly Jerusalem in the world of ideas, which is the paradigma. The paradigma is a Platonic word. Right? The paradigma that uh, this earthly Jerusalem fits matches the paradigm, the paradigma, the paradigm. Of the of the heavenly Jerusalem, the midrash of two Jerusalem's seems to be a Platonic idea, namely our earthly Jerusalem is a shadow of the heavenly Jerusalem. Our earthly Jerusalem reflects the heavenly Jerusalem. The earthly Jerusalem is the physical city. The heavenly Jerusalem is the ideal city. The idea of Jerusalem. Are the rabbis talking about a platonic idea of a heavenly Jerusalem, which is the form of Jerusalem or the idea of Jerusalem, as opposed to the physical material Jerusalem down here? It sounds very much, especially when we look at the sources that speak about the heavenly Jerusalem as the dogma, for example, in Rashi's source of the earthly Jerusalem. It sounds like this is a platonic. The midrash is giving a Platonic interpretation. The midrash of two Jerusalem's does seem Platonic. The earthly Jerusalem is the physical city. The heavenly Jerusalem is the ideal city. The earthly city is in the language of Psalms 122, built like the heavenly city. Or in Plato's language, it is a shadow or an imitation. The earthly Jerusalem imitates the heavenly Jerusalem. It's an imitation of the heavenly Jerusalem. Rashi refers to the heavenly Jerusalem as the dogma, the paradigm of the earthly Jerusalem. Yet there is one obvious sense in which the Midrash of two Jerusalems is the very opposite of Plato. One can say it is both a Platonic Midrash and an anti-Platonic Midrash at the same time. Yet there is one obvious sense in which the Midrash of two Jerusalems is the very opposite of Plato. For Plato, our physical world depends on the world of ideas. The real thing that comes first for Plato is always the world of ideas. Our world is an imitation of the world of ideas. What comes first is always the world of ideas. But according to the Midrash of the two Jerusalems, the ideal city is dependent on the physical one. God's entrance into the heavenly Jerusalem is dependent on his entrance in the earthly Jerusalem. God says, I'm not coming in to the heavenly Jerusalem, the Yerushalayim Shel Ma'ala, until I first come into the Yerushalayim Shel Mata. And that's an anti-Platonic idea that the heavenly Jerusalem is dependent on the earthly Jerusalem. What's done in the earthly Jerusalem determines what's going to happen in the heavenly Jerusalem. What is the meaning of this curious anti-Platonic anti -Platonic priority of the earthly Jerusalem to the heavenly Jerusalem? Some of the medieval Jewish Maimonidean philosophers understood the Midrash as referring to the chronological priority of ethics to science, or the vita activa to the vita contemplativa. They interpreted the two Jerusalems in terms of Maimonides' distinction between the perfection of the body and the perfection of the soul in the Guide of the Perplexed, part two, chapter 40, and part three, chapter 27. According to this distinction, the perfection of the body, namely the physical perfection, the perfection of the body, namely peace and health and physical success is a necessary condition for achieving the perfection of the soul, namely truth and science and knowledge of God. I will not enter Jerusalem on high until I have entered Jerusalem down below. Thus means ethics is a necessary condition for the spiritual life. If you want to live the spiritual life, first you have to live the ethical life. Ethics is the prerequisite for living the spiritual life. 
First, you have to live an ethical life, and then you can live a spiritual life. As the prophet Zachariah said, Eta emet v'hashalam ehavu. You have two values, the value of truth and the value of peace. You can't have the truth unless first you have peace. You can't, you can't have spiritual connection. You can't have spiritual union until first you live an ethical life. Ethics has to come first, and then one can have mysticism. Ethics first, mysticism second. According to this distinction, the perfection of the body, peace is a necessary condition for achieving the perfection of the soul. I will not enter the Jerusalem on high until I have entered the Jerusalem down below. Thus means ethics is a necessary condition for the spiritual life. Rabbi Moses Ibn Tibon, if you look at source sheet, text number 17, there's a reading from the Maimonidean philosopher Moses Ibn Tibon, who was the son of Samuel Ibn Tibon, who was the son of Judah Ibn Tibon. This is the grandson, Moses Ibn Tibon in his commentary on Song of Songs, writes that first one must perform God's commandments and laws in this world, mitzvotai v'torotai. They are a prerequisite for the ultimate perfection, which is shleimut ha-nefesh, v'udveikuta v'sechel ha-nifrad v'hisharuta. So the ultimate goal of the human being is shleimut ha-nefesh, the perfection of the soul spiritual happiness, spiritual felicity. That's the ultimate goal of the human being. Union with God, right? or in, in Arabic, itisal, union with God, dveikut with God, uh, conjunction with God. Uh, and Ibn Tibon says, what is this midrash about the two Jerusalems coming to tell us? When God says, I will not come into the heavenly Jerusalem until I first come into the earthly Jerusalem, he is saying that first you have to be ethical. First you have to observe my practical commandments and observe the law. First you have to have ethics and politics. And then you can have dveikut. Then you can have itisal. Then you can have conjunction with the divine. And then you can have eternal life. First you have to have the ethical political life on earth. And then you can have the heavenly, eternal life. But ethics always has to come first. And that's how Moses Ibn Tibon interprets this uh, midrash about the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. Perfection of the body, namely ethics and politics, is a prerequisite for perfection of the soul, tveikut, which is eternal life. Uh, there's also another interpretation of bound together, hubrala yachdav. Right? We saw one interpretation. Now we're going, we're going back to, to source sheets 15 and 16. We're going back to sources 15 and 16, which we skipped over, and we're coming back to them now. 15, uh, sex number 15 and 16. Right? We saw that the midrash interpreted shehubrala yachdav in a vertical way. Jerusalem here on earth is connected with Jerusalem on top, Ubrala Yachtav, right? Uh, the Psalmist's description of Jerusalem as bound together was interpreted by the Midrash vertically, but there are also other interpretations where it is interpreted horizontally. Jerusalem is connected not with what is above, but Jerusalem connects everyone on earth. Jerusalem, it was taught, in other words, horizontal. So you have a uh, vertical interpretation of Chubra la Yachtav and a horizontal interpretation of Chubra la Yachtav. Jerusalem, it was taught, does not only bind together earth and heaven, but also binds together all the inhabitants, all its inhabitants. In the Jerusalem Talmud, in the tractate of Hagiga, which you see there in the text number 15, Jerusalem is described as a city that binds Israel one to the other. Shemichaberet Yisrael zelazeh, right? You see it there. Ka'ir shechubrala yachdav, shemichaberet Yisrael zelazeh, horizontal, 
like a city, a city that binds together all Israel. Or in another statement in Jerusalem Talmud from the tractate of Baba Kama, like a city, what does it mean? Shehi osa kol Yisrael chaverim. Right? A city that makes all Israel friends, right? Which makes all Israel friends. So we have this expression, which has two meanings. It has a vertical meaning that it is the city which is connected to the heavenly city. And it also has a horizontal meaning, namely, it is a city that makes all its inhabitants friends. Vertical interpretation points, right? A city that makes all Israel called Kol Yisrael Chaberim. The, ver the vertical interpretation points to the heavenly Jerusalem, the spiritual city, which binds earth and heaven in prayer and prophecy. While the horizontal interpretation points to the earthly Jerusalem, the city of peace, which binds all its inhabitants together as friends. <coughs> Why is Jerusalem commonly called in Hebrew Yerushalayim? And if you look in the in the uh, in the in the in the Tanakh in the Bible, you'll see that in almost all cases, the verb the, the name Jerusalem appears as Yerushalayim, not Yerushalayim. What is uh, what is this uh, Yerushalayim? Why is it why is it why is Jerusalem called Yerushalayim and not Yerushalayim? Uh, if we, yes, if you look in uh, note number four, if you go down a little bit or, or to look at note number four uh, on the bottom there, there's note number four, right? Uh, a little further down, isn't there a note number four there on the uh, screen? It's no, not text number four, note number four on the bottom, footnote number four. Uh, yeah, I think it's here. It should be there. It is. There's four, right? So you see in note number four, I mentioned here that the word Jerusalem is always written in the Hebrew Bible without the additional yod. It's written Yerushalayim. It's not written Yerushalayim, except in five places. Right? There are five places. Once in the book of Jeremiah, once in the book of Esther, once in one Chronicles, and once in two Chronicles. Uh, and twice in two chronicles, there, these five places where uh, where it's written Yerushalayim, but all the other places in the Bible, it's written Yerushalayim. It's pronounced Yerushalayim, but it's written Yerushalayim without the Yud. Other examples of the, uh, so it's, it's written and it looks like it's a dual form, right? What's a dual form? Uh, <clears throat> why is Jerusalem commonly called in Hebrew Yerushalayim? Uh, which seems to have the dual suffix, right? Not simply Yerushalayim. Some philosophers like Rabbi Jacob Anatoly in the 13th century, early 13th century, explain this in the light of the Midrash about two Jerusalems. Why is it called Yerushalayim? Because Yerushalayim is the dual form. It refers to the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly Jerusalem. That's why it's called Yerushalayim. It's not just Yerushalayim, one Jerusalem, but there are two Jerusalems, Yerushalayim. And therefore, it has the dual form, just like a nayim, we say eyes, a nayim, two eyes, oznayim, ears, raglayim, feet, yadayim, hands, shadayim, breasts, mishkafayim, eyeglasses. It's not a biblical term, but it's not the same, same idea. Michnasayim, trousers, shabuayim, a fortnight, shunatayim, two years, or ofenayim, a bicycle. Jerusalem is called Yerushalayim, says. Uh, Rabbi Jacob Anatoly, for the same reason, because there are two Jerusalems, just like there are two eyes and we say Einayim, and there are two ears and we say Oznayim, and there are two feet and we say Raglayim. So there are two Jerusalems, so we say Yerushalayim. Because there are two Jerusalems, there are twin cities bound together. Uh, Rabbi Levi ben Gershom, or Gersonides, in source sheet number 19, the greatest Jewish Aristotelian philosopher after Maimonides observed that the word shalem, salem, embedded in the name Yerushalayim, can mean perfect. So Yerushalayim has in it this word for perfection, shalem. 
and argued that the name Jerusalem refers to the perfection, the Shlemut, or in Greek, the Arete. Jerusalem is the city of perfection, the virtuous city, the city of virtue, Shlemut. Now, if Yerushalayim refers to perfection, and if, as the previously mentioned rabbis have argued, Yerushalayim is a dual form of Yerushalayim, then it would seem to follow that Jerusalem refers to two perfections associated with the two Jerusalems, the perfection of the body, physical perfection, namely the perfection of the earthly Jerusalem, and that of the heavenly Jerusalem, namely the perfection of the soul. So those two perfections that Maimonides spoke about in the Guide of the Flex, part two, chapter 40, and part three, chapter 27, the perfection of the body and the perfection of the soul are found in the earthly Jerusalem, the perfection of the body, in the heavenly Jerusalem, the perfection of the soul. And that's why we don't just say Yerushalayim, but Yerushalayim, because Yerushalayim refers both to the ethical and political perfection of the body, namely peace, and to the spiritual perfection of the soul, namely truth and conjunction with God. Jerusalem is the city of perfection, it is the virtuous city. Now, if Jerusalem refers to perfection, and if the previously mentioned rabbis have argued Yerushalayim is the dual form of Jerusalem, then Yerushalayim refers to those two perfections, the perfection of the body and perfection of the soul. We can now move to our next topic about the name of Jerusalem. What does the name of Jerusalem mean? What is the meaning of the, the name of city of Jerusalem? The most well-known midrash concerning the name of Jerusalem is that found in Genesis Rabbah, chapter 56, which reports the preferences of Abraham and Shem. Identif and Shem is identified by the rabbis with King Malchitzedek. If we try hard enough, we can see in this midrash a reference to the two Jerusalems. This is on the source sheet number 20. Let's look at number 20, text number 20. Abraham called Jerusalem Yir'eh, and Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord shall see, Adonai Yir'eh, right? In Genesis 22, Abraham calls the place Adonai Yir'eh, the Lord shall see. Shem called it Shalem, or Salem, Salem, and Malchizedek, king of Shalem, king of Salem, Shalem. So we have two names of Jerusalem. Abraham called Jerusalem Yir'eh, from the word to see, and Shalem, and Shem called it Shalem, from the notion of peace. Said the Holy One, blessed be he, if I call it Yireh, as Abraham called it, Abraham wanted to call it Yireh, meaning a city of vision, right? Referring to the perfection of the soul, un uniting with God, the city of vision. That's what Abraham wanted to call it, Abraham prophet said the Holy One, blessed be he, if I call it Yir'eh, as Abraham called it, Shem, a righteous man, will grumble. Right? We, God says, I've had two, two suggestions for what to call Jerusalem. That prophet Abraham wants to call it uh, Yir'eh, namely a city of vision, a city where God of Re'iya, a city of vision, Yir'eh. Uh, but the king, Malchitzedek, uh, uh, Shem, he wants to call it, he wants to call it uh, Shalem, Salem, a city of peace. So the, the prophet wants to call it uh, a city of vision, as prophets would want usually to, to think. Prophets think in terms of vision. So the prophet wants to call it Yireh, and the king, who thinks in terms of political, wants to call it uh, Shalem, the city of peace. So God says, what am I going to call it? If I call it Yireh, the king is going to be upset. And if I call it Shalem, the prophet is going to be upset. So the Holy One, blessed be he. If I call it Yireh, as Abraham called it, Shem, a righteous man will grumble. If I call it Shalem, as Malchizedek called it, Abraham, a righteous man will, jump, will grumble. Rather, I shall call it Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Yerushalayim. As the two of them called it, I will integrate both names, Yireh Shalem, Jerusalem, the city of vision and the city of peace. 
The prophet named Jerusalem after the heavenly city, Yireh, namely a city of providence, a city of divine vision, while the king named it after the earthly one, namely Shalem, peace. God compromised between the two righteous human beings, the prophet and the king, and named it after both, both the heavenly Jerusalem and the earthly cities. Jerusalem, Yireh, Shalem, is the city of divine providence and vision, the city of prophetic vision, the city of Yireh, of Re'iya, and it is also the city of peace, the city of Shalem. And one may say that we're going too far with all these interpretations. How far can one go with Midrashic interpretations? So maybe we're exaggerating with Midrashic interpretations. Are we going too far with all these Midrashic interpretations of the name Jerusalem? Well, I don't think so. Actually, we have barely scratched the surface. One could go on almost forever with interpretations about Jerusalem. There are countless more speculations about the meaning of Jerusalem. Indeed, the name invites interpretation. The Kabbalist Rabbi Joseph Jikatilia observed in source sheet number 21, something very interesting about the name Jerusalem. If you add up the letters of Jerusalem in Gematria and you figure out the you figure out the, uh, the numerical value of the name Jerusalem, it turns out that it is 586 without the Yud, Yerushalayim, and 596 with the Yud. So Jerusalem is either 586 with the Yud or 596 without the Yud. The former number corresponds to the Hebrew word Perush, Peresh Vav Shin, commentary without the yud, in the scriptio defectiva, right? The, the perush can be written without a yud, but perush can also be written with a yud. And if it's written with a yud in the scriptio plena, right? The ketiv chaser and the ketiv malay, in ketiv chaser, in scriptio defectiva, uh, the perush is written without a yud, and in uh, scriptio plena, it's written with a yud. If it's written without a Yud, uh, Perush adds up to 586, which is Yerushalayim. If it's written with a Yud, then Perush adds up to 596, which is uh, Yerushalayim. With or without the additional syllable, Jerusalem means commentary. Jerusalem means Perush. Jerusalem is the city of commentary, the city of interpretations, the city of exegesis. And now we move on to our next subject, the navel of the earth or the belly button of the earth. According to a Midrash interpretation of uh, Ezekiel th chapter 38, Jerusalem is described as the Jerusalem is described as the umbilicus mundi, right? The navel of the world, the belly button of the world. The prophet refers to the umbilical of the world. The prophet refers to they that dwell on the navel of the earth. This is in Sorshi, paragraph 22. What is this navel? What is the navel of the earth? The Midrash answers that the navel of the earth, Tabur Ha'aretz, is Jerusalem. Sorshi, number, paragraph 23 and 24. Now, in what sense is Jerusalem the geological belly button? In what sense is Jerusalem the umbilicus mundi? The rabbinic passage explains that Jerusalem is likened to a navel in two senses. It is the center of the earth, just like the navel is the center. And it is also the foundation stone, the place where creation began. So the, the idea of umbilicus mundi, the idea of the navel has two meanings. It can mean the center, Jerusalem is the spiritual center of the world but it could also mean the foundation. It's the beginning, the foundation of everything. The world was created from Jerusalem, just as the world is created from the umbilicus, the place where the creation began. Rabbi Isaac ben Solomon ibn Abi Sahula, a late 13th century Kabbalist, offered a third interpretation. Jerusalem, he wrote in his commentary on Song of Songs, and this is source sheet number 25. We go down to 20, 25, text number 25. 
Uh, Jerusalem is the navel of earth, and just as the navel of the fetus is connected to the placenta of its mother and receives from it its nourishment and sustenance, so Jerusalem is connected to Jerusalem on high. The Jerusalem on high is the tenth sphira, the feminine shechina, the mother. The earthly Jerusalem is nourished and sustained by its heavenly mother, to whom it is, it is connected by a mystical umbilical cord. And that's the third meaning of navel. Jerusalem, therefore, is a navel in three meanings. Jerusalem is a belly button, um, umbilicus mundi in three senses. First, it's the center, just as the navel is the center. Second, it is the foundation, just as the navel is the foundation. And third, it is the source of nourishment, just as the umbilicus is the source of nourishment. The final subject that I want to discuss uh, is in source sheet uh, numbers, paragraph text 26 and 27. In his On Zion, in his discussion of Zion, of Jerusalem, Martin Buber cites the Midrash in Tanit about God's not entering heavenly Jerusalem until he enters the earthly one. The Midrash, the Midrash expresses in his view, God's abiding faithfulness, Ne'emanut. What does Buber learn from the Midrash? That God is faithful to Jerusalem. God is not going to go into his own Jerusalem until first he, we let him in to our Jerusalem down here. God is faithful, Ne'emanut, the faithfulness of God to the earthly Jerusalem, God's faithfulness to the earthly Jerusalem. God is committed to the establishment of a just community in Zion, to turning the earthly Jerusalem into the city of a great king. And until this is established, God does not want to enter his Jerusalem on high. In terms of Buber's dialogical philosophy, this means that one cannot say thou to God until one first learns how to say thou to other human beings. It also means that God has a stake in the achievement of social justice in Israel and peace between Israel and her neighbors. To Buber's mind, the voluntaristic, anarchistic, socialistic kibbutz was a promising attempt to create a true I thou community, reminiscent of the kingdom of God that existed in ancient Israel during the time of the judges and which had been envisioned by the Torah of Moses. This is in source sheet number 27. He contrasted, Buber contrasted the socialism of the kibbutz with that of the then Soviet Union. The latter, the, the socialism of the Soviet Union was authoritarian, totalitarian, and imposed from without by a central government. The socialism of Jerusalem was spontaneously and freely chosen by the community. Buber called the authoritarian socialism Moscow and the voluntaristic Jerusalem, uh, the voluntaristic socialism he called Jerusalem. By using the name Jerusalem, he intimated that the kibbutz, which he described as, and he didn't call it the Kinneret or the Ganya or any, uh, 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 any of the names of the, uh, of the early uh, kibbutzim, but he referred to the kibbutz movement uh, as, uh, as uh, Jerusalem. Uh, and the voluntaristic one, Jerusalem, by using the name Jerusalem, he uh, intimated that the kibbutz, which he described as an experiment that did not fail, held out a hope for God to enter the earthly Jerusalem. The kibbutz, Buber saw in the kibbutz, a, a community, a voluntary community of justice, which holds out the hope of turning Jerusalem into the heavenly Jerusalem. He held out the hope for God to enter the earthly Jerusalem. This was the kind of community that Buber thought that God means when he says, I will not enter the, I will not enter the heavenly Jerusalem until I first enter the earthly Jerusalem. And Buber said, when God is talking about that, he has in mind a community of justice, a community of people who say thou to each other. And this he saw in the kibbutz, which he called an experiment that did not fail. He said it's not an experiment that succeeded, but an experiment that did not fail. By using the term Jerusalem, he intimated that the kibbutz, which he described as an experiment that did not fail, 
held out a hope for God to enter the earthly Jerusalem. In a deep sense, Zionism for Buber was the attempt to let God into the earthly Jerusalem, thus enabling God to enter the Jerusalem on high. Buber's thoughts are inspiring, but also challenging and chilling. God is still waiting for us to let him into the earthly Jerusalem. Thank you very much.